Mary was born and raised in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and attended the University of Pittsburgh Honors College, where he majored in biomedical engineering. After gaining exposure to healthcare at UPMC, he returned home to Philadelphia to attend Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine and quickly developed an interest in internal medicine and simulation-based education. He attended Pennsylvania Hospital Internal Medicine Program for Residency and Chief Residency, where he developed his passion for point-of-care ultrasound and its applications within hospital medicine. Through the POCUS network, he met Charles Lopresti, who became his mentor and trained him at the Cleveland VA, and brought him into the inner ring of national POCUS experts as junior POCUS faculty. Since starting at the Cleveland VA, he has now taken over the role of Director of POCUS for the Medicine Service. He has implemented multiple teaching initiatives with his colleague, Dr. Paul Shanick, including the residency-wide asynchronous POCUS curriculum and the UH Case Western hybrid POCUS elective. He also developed a local faculty POCUS training course at the VA Medical Center and is working towards developing POCUS competency within the acute medicine section. He works closely with the VA Innovation Center for 3D modeling and device design, and he is working on a POCUS teaching prototype to better help his colleagues teach learners of all levels. In January this year, he and his multidisciplinary team helped Cleveland become the second VA medical center in the country to successfully implement a hospital-wide POCUS server system to help ensure quality assurance and provide more efficient feedback to learners. Thanks again to everyone for joining and please join me in welcoming Dr. Murray. Okay, thank you for the very kind introduction. And thank you all for taking time out of your busy days for our talk. So the talk's title, Why Integrate Point of Care Ultrasound into Hospital Medicine. Now for this talk, I have no disclosures to discuss. So in order to discuss point of care ultrasound and, and why it's being integrated into hospital medicine, it's important to provide context for what it is and where it comes from. So some of the learning objectives for today's talk we're gonna work on gaining a context for POCUS within the greater scheme of physical examination and medical imaging. We're gonna to try to understand some common in-hospital POCUS applications, work on developing a more intuitive sense of what the POCUS images are representing and how they're created, review some professional society stances on point of care ultrasound as it stands today in internal medicine, We'll walk through a POCUS use case together and also address some common concerns or barriers that providers have about incorporating POCUS into their practice. So prior to the invention of the stethoscope, physicians would place their ears directly on the chest of their patients in order to make a diagnosis. This technique is called immediate or direct auscultation. And this auscultation combined with inspection and palpation was what informed the next steps in testing and management. The field of radiology and its various imaging studies did not yet exist. In 1816, when consulted to evaluate a young woman who was thought to be suffering of heart disease, a French physician, Dr. Lenick, rolled up a piece of paper and used it to auscultate for cardiac murmurs. He called the device Le Cylindre, which later became known as the stethoscope. The stethoscope, derived from the two Greek words stethos, meaning chest, and skopos, for examination, arguably one of the most recognized symbols of medicine today. In the century following the invention of the stethoscope, the field of medicine was radically changed by the discovery of x-rays by the German physicist, William Röntgen in 1895. Here's the first x-ray that was ever created. And this is of Röntgen's wife, Anna Bertha's hand. It's known as hand mit Röntgen. Just shy of a hundred years after the invention of the stethoscope, the British ocean liner Titanic sinks into the North Atlantic Ocean, 400 miles south of Newfoundland, Canada, which in turn triggers a push to detect underwater structures such as icebergs. Technology further developed by French physicist Paul Langan 
during World War I to locate submarines. Branching off of Langen's work, the Austrian, the, the Austrian physici physician, uh, Dr. Dusik, started to do the, the first use of ultrasound for medical imaging. And he did work called, titled The Ultrasonic Investigation of Brain Illnesses using his ultrasonic apparatus. Keep in mind, this was in the 1940s, and this is the first time that ultrasound was ever used in medicine. After Do Dr. Dusica's work, um, ultrasound experienced explosion um, of use within medicine. In the 1950s, the field of echocardiography was established. In the 60s, ultrasound started to be applied to obstetrics. The 70s saw the, the, the birth of you know, ultrasound being used by surgeons and, and early ER physicians when assessing trauma patients. In the 80s, the world of ultrasound was forever changed by the work from Dr. Lichtenstein, um, a French critical care physician, who was one of the, who was the first person to really work with ultrasound of the lungs and opened up a lot of new possibilities. The 90s saw um, a, a birth of US uh, of ultrasound guided bedside invasive procedures with widespread use and adoption by critical care and anesthesia. And it was in 1999 that the American Medical Association passed the, rev the revolutionary bill, a resolution, AMA HR 802. And in AMA HR 802, the AMA stated that the AMA affirms that ultrasound imaging is within the scope of practice of appropriately trained physicians. So this was a landmark resolution. And since the AMA's resolution back in 1999, acute care specialties, such as emergency medicine and critical care medicine have incorporated POCUS into their graduate medical education training programs. However, however as of yet, most internal med medicine residency training programs have only begun to incorporate point of care ultrasound into their curriculum. In terms of understanding where ultrasound fits in among the available diagnostic imaging modalities, it's important to break down the imaging modalities we have available by ionizing radiation and no ionizing radiation modalities. It's important to understand that ionizing radiation or electromagnetic waves is the backbone of X-ray, computerized tomography, fluoroscopy, and positron emission tomography, whereas sound waves and radio waves offer no ionizing radiation to the patient or technician, sound waves in the form of ultrasound and radio waves in the form of magnetic resonance imaging. As we know, radiation damage to cells is serious. It occurs via direct damage to DNA fusion, via uh, structural damage, for, damage from free radical creation, um, and also from double strand breaks. Cell damage, if not repaired, can lead to cell death or development of cancer, as we know. But let's try to quantify that radiation a little better. It's important to understand that whether it's x-ray, CT, or fluoroscopy, the image that's being created is actually the leftover radiation that was not absorbed by the body. The scientific unit for this uh, absorption of radiation is the millisiever or the MSV. And it's important to think about radiation as compared to the natural background radiation um, that one would experience through normal, uh, normal life. Um, so for example, the average person in the United States receives an effective dose of three MSV per year just from natural cosmic radiation and radon exposure. Of course, that number is higher in places of higher altitude or areas with high radon. So now that we have that baseline, we can talk about some common imaging modalities that are ordered. So in comparison to the background radiation that one would experience, a chest X-ray uh, delivers 10 days worth um, of natural background radiation. A low dose CT scan, of the chest, such as done for lung cancer screening, is 1.5 MSV, which is equivalent to about six months 
of background radiation for the average US citizen. Whereas a standard CT chest, such as those done in a dyspneic patient who were looking for a PE, we're talking about two years of natural background radiation per scan. Whereas a CT abdomen pelvis with and without IV contrast is, a, is five or greater than five years of background radiation per scan. So focusing in on ultrasound as a clinical imaging modality, what is ultrasound? Well, it's, it's a dynamic tomographic imaging modality. So dynamic meaning that it's moving, moving pictures. This is not a static CT or MRI picture or a freeze frame in time. We can actually visualize the movement of both anatomic structures and also detect movement of fluid, depending on the mode that's used. It's a tomographic imaging modality. So what does that mean? So tomographic from Greek tomos, meaning sliced or section and English graphy. So tomographic imaging studies, we can think of as rather than stacked images that would be created, for example, by a chest X-ray, it is a true slice through the body as is done with computerized tomography or magnetic resonance imaging. The difference between ultrasound and computerized tomography or MRI is that plane, orientation, depth, and gain are all controlled by the operator at the time of image acquisition. So now that we've discussed ultrasound, what makes point of care ultrasound different? Well, part of it depends on the goals. So comprehensive or diagnostic ultrasound is done to evaluate all the organs in an anatomical region. For example, a comprehensive exam of the right upper quadrant would give descriptions of the liver, gallbladder, and biliary ducts. Whereas with point of care ultrasound, the goal is not to image one area, the goal is to answer a focused clinical question. Um, so the corollary for the right upper quadrant would be the evaluation with focus for presence or absence of intraperitoneal fluid. It's binary, is it there, or is it not there? Much more focused. In terms of image acquisition and interpretation, there's a large difference. Diagnostic and comprehensive ultrasound, the image is acquired by a sonographer with specific training and interpreted by a radiologist. Point of care ultrasound is done by the provider and also interpreted in real time by the provider who has the, the clinical question. A large difference between comprehensive and diagnostic ultrasound versus point of care ultrasound is the ability to evaluate multi -body, multiple body systems at the same time. So for example, it is common for multiple body systems to be evaluated in undifferentiated hypotension with point of care ultrasound of the heart, inferior vena cava, lungs, abdomen, and lower extremity veins being typically performed to answer the clinical question, with the clinical question being what is causing the patient's undifferentiated hypotension. Additionally, comprehensive ultrasound is not used for serial examinations, and point of care ultrasound frequently is. It's commonly done serially to look for changes in clinical status or to evaluate response to therapy, such as monitoring changes for the heart, lungs, and inferior vena cava during diuresis or fluid resuscitation. This is table one from the position statement of the Society of Hospital Medicine on point of care ultrasound. It covers the common POCUS applications for hospitalists today. So you can see that common POCUS applications for hospitalists include single organ, so cardiac, pulmonary, abdominal, vascular, musculoskeletal, and also multi-system applications. Those are all diagnostic point of care ultrasound applications. There are also procedural applications as well. So to get a little more detailed, it's common for hospitalists to use point of care ultrasound to do left ventricular and right ventricular assessment, to look for atrial size, to check for central venous pressure, pericardial effusions, chamber hypertrophy, as well as gross valvular abnormalities. 
Within the pulmonary applications, the most common for hospitalists are to assess for pleural effusions. Are they present, are they absent, and what's their, what's their character? Interstitial syndromes, alveolar syndromes, and pneumothorax. From an abdominal perspective, the hospitalist is looking for free fluid, kidney size, hydronephrosis, bladder volume, gallbladder and spleen and liver assessment. Vascular studies include deep venous thrombosis exams, as well as looking for um, triple A's for abdominal aortic aneurysms. And musculoskeletal applications for the hospitalist include cellulitis, abscess, joint effusion, as well as fracture. The most common multi-system applications for hospital providers is for the assessment of hypotension and shock, for resuscitation, for a determination of the etiology of dyspnea, and for acute renal failure. And of course, there are all of the procedural applications, paracentesis, thoracentesis, vascular access, whether that be central or peripheral access, arterial lines, arthrocentesis, abscess drainage, and finally, lumbar puncture. So this is a good time to talk about workflows. The conventional workflow for somebody who does not use point of care ultrasound is on slide left, is as follows. So the provider will typically perform a history and physical with the patient. If the diagnosis is not known, they'll order diagnostic imaging study, which may or may not have radiation exposure to the patient. The patient's moved to an imaging area for image acquisition. The radiology technician performs an imaging study. The radiologist later interprets that imaging study. And then finally, the provider receives an imaging report, which the provider will then integrate imaging findings into their clinical decision-making and share the results with the patients. I'm sure all of you are familiar with that flow. Now, the workflow with point of care ultrasound is as follows. The provider performs history and physical with the patient, including point of care ultrasound, and obtains images, interprets, and clinically integrates their findings while explaining these findings to their patient in real time. If they have answered the clinical question that they have, they're done. If they've not answered their question, they can now order their diagnostic imaging if, if the etiology is not known. So now that we've discussed some of those basics, it's important to try to do our best to visualize what is POCUS? How is this image created? So let's start with something that we all already know. Most of us have viewed enough standard computerized tomography images to be able to visualize that the image we see on the screen represents a tomographic slice through anatomy that we know. Here's an example of a CT of chest in coronal view. From practice and experience, we're comfortable using the mouse to scroll anterior to posterior, moving the coronal plane as we scroll the mouse. And we, whether or not we know it, we are forming a 3D image in our head of the relevant structures in the hopes that this will help answer the diagnostic question that we have. So whether or not we recognize it, most of us already actually have the skills that we need to synthesize tomographic imaging information and to use it in clinical practice. And this is the most important skill um, when, when using point-of-care ultrasound. Now, in order to translate the skills that we already have for reading, 
CT or MRI images into imaging interpretation skills for POCUS, it's important to cover two basic but critical concepts. Every POCUS image will be labeled with a screen orientation marker, which is seen on the upper left-hand side of the ultrasound screen in radiology convention. The screen orientation marker aligns with the probe orientation marker, which is denoted by the spine or an indicator marker on the probe. The side of the screen that lies on the side of the screen orientation marker corresponds with the physical space that lies on the side of the probe orientation marker. By convention on the top of the screen, the top of the screen, which is also called the near field, it represents the physical space that's closer to the probe. And the bottom or the far field represents the area that is farther away from the probe in physical space. Rather than scrolling the mouse, as is done in computerized tomography, the provider controls the location of the tomographic plane of imaging by moving the probe around the patient. So to demonstrate this, we start off with our probe orientation marker with the red arrow in the same direction as the screen orientation marker. We arrange the probe orientation marker up towards the, the patient's head in standard radiology imaging convention. This is creating a coronal plane image. So this is me just manipulating the model to try to help visualize how it is that we're getting the image that we are on the screen. And so that is all we are doing when we're doing point of care ultrasound is that in addition to our inspection and our palpation and our auscultation, we have added the additional dimension of direct visualization of our physical exam findings. So one more time, we are looking in the coronal plane. And this is our direct inspection. And the beauty of being able to see these images is that in addition to giving us a gold standard for our physical exam, it also allows us a totally new level of communication with our patients about their disease processes. So now that we've started to visualize where the images come from, let's discuss professional groups that endorse POCUS and its use in hospital medicine. So diagnostic point of care ultrasound is supported by multiple professional societies, including the Society of Hospital Medicine, as well as the American College of Physicians. And in their position statements, they make it clear that point of care ultrasound can be used to guide clinical decision-making prior to bedside procedures. It can help determine the most appropriate management strategy, and it can also be used to rapidly assess for immediate post-procedural complications, such as pneumothorax, or if the patient develops new symptoms. In the position statement, it's made clear that ultrasound guidance lowers the complication rates and increases success rates of invasive procedures. The following slide represents individual dedicated position statements about each one of these procedures from the Society of Hospital Medicine. For vascular access, there's a dedicated position statement that in, in depth goes into providers should be using real-time ultrasound guidance for the placement of peripheral IVs in patients with difficult venous access, and that's to reduce the procedure time, the number of needle insertion attempts, and needle redirection. Central venous access should be used for real-time guidance for internal jugular vein catheterization. 
to reduce the number of mechanical infectious complications, the number of needle passes, the time to cannulation, and to increase the overall procedure success rate. For Paris and TSIS, the Society of Hospital Medicine recommends ultrasound to be done to reduce the risk of serious complications and to improve the success rates of the overall procedure. For Thoris and Tesis, Society of Hospital recommends, Society of Hospital Medicine recommends to reduce the risk of complications with the most common being pneumothorax. Thoris and Tesis should be performed under ultrasound guidance and also to uh, increase the success rate. For lumbar puncture, it's important to use point of care ultrasound to reduce the number of needle insertion attempts and needle redirections and increase the overall procedure success rates, especially in patients who are obese or have difficult to palpate landmarks. So to talk about sensitivity for these tests, long point of care ultrasound versus chest X-ray, um, this has been studied and lung ultrasound as compared to chest X-ray was more sensitive for picking up interstitial syndrome, consolidation, pleural effusion, as well as pneumothorax. In fact, the sensitivity for picking up consolidation or pleural effusion in the point of care ultrasound groups was 100%. Long ultrasound versus CT or X-ray for diagnosis of pneumonia, two meta-analyses meta were done, and with a sensitivity of between 85 and 86%, and a specificity of 88 to 93%, pretty pow powerful metadata supporting the use of long ultrasound when possible. For our POCUS use case, we'll discuss a 77-year-old male with atrial fibrillation on direct oral anticoagulant therapy and rate control, as well as six sinus syndrome status post placement of a biatrial permanent placemaker six months previously. He was evaluated by his outpatient provider for dyspnea that had been present for over a month with associated chest pressure. Prior to his visit, he had been started on oral diuretic therapy due to his shortness of breath and bilateral low extremity edema. Treatment with diuretics had improved his lower extremity edema, but his shortness of breath persisted. The etiology of his dyspnea was thought to be persistent atrial fibrillation, and thus he was arranged for outpatient cardioversion. The patient presented for the outpatient cardioversion had two shocks with external cardioverter to fibrillator device, but remained in atrial fibrillation. He was admitted for observation with plans to start an antiarrhythmic agent. And on post-op day, or on post-procedure day two, the patient was selected at random and offered the option of being part of our educational point of care ultrasound elective um, scanning opportunity. His vitals at the time of us going to perform the, the educational point of care ultrasound exam were blood pressure of 151 over 98, heart rate of 61, respiratory rate of 24, and an SpO2 of 95% on room air. Initially, he was conversant with our group. He was in no acute distress. However, with a little bit of exertion moving into position for the POCUS exam, he became quite uncomfortable with mild respiratory distress. His lungs were cleared auscultation bilaterally, and we did note jugular venous distension to about four centimeters above the sternal angle. He did have two plus pitting edema and bilateral extremities. Chest X-ray showed atrial fibrillation with PVCs, T-wave inversion, and with in lateral leads and no electrical alternance. Upon putting the transducer on the chest, this is what one of our learners immediately saw. Here's a peristernal long axis view obtained by one of our learners who was on day two of their point of care ultrasound elective. Please note the findings concerning for a large circumferential pericardial fusion. To confirm the finding of the pericardial fusion from the long axis view, a follow-up of the peristernal short was obtained. It confirmed presence of a circumferential pericardial fusion. In preparation for obtaining the inferior vena cava view, a subcostal four chamber was obtained 
and the view also showed evidence of a large circumferential pericardial fusion. From the subcostal four, the right atrium was centered and counterclockwise rotation and rocking was performed to obtain the inferior vena cava view, which is seen above. The inferior vena cava view demonstrated a dilated and plethoric inferior vena cava with less than 50% respiratory variation. The patient had a large pericardial fusion, which was incidentally noted. The primary team was informed concern for symptomatic pericardial fusion and a stat formal echocardiography was obtained, which confirmed the large pericardial fusion also with slight right atrial systolic collapse concerning as the POCUS had been for, for potential impending cardiac tamponade. The patient was immediately transferred to higher level of care. The patient had pericardial drain placed with 1500 cc's of bloody output and relief of his symptoms. The drain was removed after two days and he had no immediate complications. And in the setting of hemorrhagic pericardial fusion, his anticoagulation was held and he did well. So obviously there's a lot of power with point of care ultrasound. It's a very empowering skill set, um, but there are also some concerns about incorporating that powerful skill set into clinical practice. So let's go through some of them. Here's a big one. What about medical liability? So a review of the literature, and this was literature done on emergency department physicians, um, and it was countrywide over multiple years, multiple studies. It did show that there absolutely were malpractice cases um, that involved point of care ultrasound. However, in every single malpractice case that existed for point of care ultrasound, um, the malpractice case was actually based on failure to perform um, point of care ultrasound or failure to perform it in a timely manner. There was not a single case which involved failure to interpret or misdiagnosis of POCUS when POCUS was used. The same exact uh, literature was literature search was done outside of emergency medicine to look into some of the fields of neonatology and also pediatrics and specialties. Um, and again, all malpractice cases were aimed at failure to perform POCUS when it was indicated. And again, there were no cases for failure to interpret or for misdiagnosis when using point of care ultrasound. You know, another concern is, but what if I can't acquire the images? You know, what if, you know, a lot of us went into medicine um, rather than surgery and, you know, maybe didn't think that we would have to be as, um, as skilled with our hands. And so there, there is a lot of um, concern when I'm teaching people, uh, well, am I even going to be able to do this? Am I going to be able to get this skill? Um, there's also other providers that I talk to who they just don't want to use point of care ultrasound in their practice. And, and that's fine. Um, you know, not, not every provider will have the desire or the ability to achieve the skills needed for POCUS image acquisition. Um, however, providers will likely still find value in understanding point of care ultrasound nomenclature. They'll find value in working on image interpretation and knowing supporting evidence and pitfalls for you know, knowing supporting evidence and pitfalls for clinical integration of point of care ultrasound findings. These skills will allow them to communicate effectively with and understand the management decisions made by their colleagues who are competent in point of care ultrasound use. And I think this is an important point because the number of colleagues that become competent in point of care ultrasound use will only go up. And so for even those who are not going to make it a priority to learn this, you know, as a skill, it is at least important to become comfortable with it so that you can communicate. So another thing is, well, when do I get started? When should I get started? The reality is that point of care ultrasound is already here. Um, education is starting in medical school and more and more students are showing up on clinical rotations with basic point of care, ultrasound knowledge, and skills. It's quite impressive to me how 
advanced some of our uh, rotators are with their point of care ultrasound skills. Um, in fact, some of them are even showing up with their own ultrasound devices. So for all of us in academic roles who provide supervision to the next generation of providers, it is important to grow our fund of point of care ultrasound knowledge as best we can in order to provide the best support to our learners and to keep our patients safe. And so this is just a, a screenshot of um, Temple School of Medicine. Uh, they were the first a school of medicine on the on the East Coast to give handheld units to their entire medical school class, and they did that in uh, 2025, or for the for the uh, medical school class of 2025. So, in summary, um, I, you know, I I hope that you found this talk helpful. Um, please reach out to me if I can if I can help with anything. Um, you know, to review our our lecture today. You know, we we talked about gaining a better context for point of care ultrasound within the greater scheme of physical examination, medical imaging. And I hope that we have a better sense of where point of care ultrasound may um, play a helpful or, or powerful role um, within the world of, you know, uh, no ionizing radiation studies. Um, hopefully we can understand um, some of the more common hospital focus applications, knowing that um, the table one that I showed is in no way meant to limit the, the type of point of care ultrasound applications that are done as much as just to summarize what is being very routinely done. Hopefully we have worked a little closer towards developing an intuitive sense of what point of care ultrasound images are re representing and how it is that we're getting the tomographic image slice that we are on the screen. We've reviewed some professional society stances on point of care ultrasound for internal medicine and understand that doing so is within the support of both societies of hospital medicine and American College of uh, Physicians. We've walked through a, post, a POCUS use case and shown its demonstration. In this case, we had a patient who had a, a positive patient outcome um, for just a purely educational scan. Um, and the number of uh, you know, point of care ultrasound exam scans that have positively benefited patients is innumerable at this point. Um, hopefully, we've also addressed some common concerns about incorporating POCUS into practice and hopefully removed a few barriers um, to those of you who may be POCUS interested, um, but a little, little hesitant. So I, I do want to give a big thank you to Dr. Smith, Augustine Brown, and Shannick for their robust support of the POCUS initiatives that we're working on at Cleveland VAMC and beyond. Um, I want to give a really big thank you to Dr. Lopresti, Dr. Sony, Dr. Tierney, Dancel, and Dr. Mintz and Wong and Liu, who give me a ton of ongoing point of care ultrasound guidance and support. And I do want to thank the UH residency team, you know, including the chiefs for the opportunity, and uh, thank my wife for everything. Here's my references. So my hope is to provide enough time that we can answer some questions. Thanks, Kevin. That was terrific. And um, I, we are so grateful, you know, for, for Charlie Lopresti for being a pioneer and developing the POCUS program here on the, on the VA side of our campus. And for you for, uh, you know, for, for coming and working with Charlie now kind of taking the leadership there and so grateful for what you and Paul Shaniak have done with the residents this year. It's really fantastic. Um, and 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 um, open it up to questions. Um, you know, as a residency director, if uh, next July a, 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 a new intern comes and says, "Oh yeah, I learned all this focus stuff in medical school," you know, I'm ready to do a, you know, where, where's your machine? I'm going to go do an ultras, you know, do a paracentesis. But what do we tell them? <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I think um, you're saying at UH or at the VA. Well, you know, I guess the residence program goes both places, but I'll say the VA, sure. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think that's, um, I think it's a great question. And I think it's actually, paracentesis is a, is a good example of something that um, there's, it's interesting how there's a lot of attending physicians who will tell me, oh, I can't do POCUS. And I'll say, okay, how do you do a, how do you do a paracentesis? They say, well, well, of course, you know, I get the ultrasound machine and I, and I put the probe on, I look for this. And so, you know, paracentesis actually represents a really, really great um, opportunity to take some of the 
some of the skills that people don't even understand that they're doing point of care ultrasound um, and to, you know, to teach them about the nomenclature and teach them about you know, the advantages of using different uh, transducer types. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the you know, paracentesis teaching and procedural teaching has to do with making sure that people have you know, good understanding of not just assessing for a fluid pocket, but also making sure that they have good command of a linear probe where they can identify and use color flow Doppler to look for vascular structures and to mark off you know, safe areas. So I think there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of room for improvement there, both at the attending and provider and training level. Yeah, and uh, um, Dr. Wiseman has a, just a comment of gratitude in the chat. And, uh, and then there's a, a, a question in the chat, the interpretation of focus is done by AI or by operator. So what's the role of AI on handheld you know, point of care yeah, so I mean, I will say that this is uh, this is something that's actively, you know, we're working on actively as, at a national level uh, for for veterans affairs and understanding and defining exactly um, what that looks like. And I think the reality is that there's going to have to be rules um, defined and standard operating procedures both for university hospitals as well as veterans affairs. And so I think that the you know the the most important uh, thing to focus on from an AI um, you know, perspective is probably making sure that the fundamental knowledge and skills are there, um, and then that that's being done with appropriate supervision and oversight. Um, so really what that requires is that that requires um, attending physicians um, at both Veterans Affairs, you know, uh, you know and also university hospitals um, to be comfortable with their fundamentals, to know the um, you know, the caveats to understand the critical structures um, and then be able to provide that guidance. Awesome. Um, you know, other questions or comments for Dr. Murray or on the topic? Uh, uh, so Dr. Sittigam has a question in the chat and I'm not sure of the answer. Maybe if uh, any of the chiefs are on or any of the Palm Creek faculty the question is, what is the adoption rate of focus in the MUCA at UH? And um, I don't know. And I, I think in terms of the residency on the UH side of things, I think residents pretty commonly use focus for, for paracentesis. And, um, you know, residents do very few thoracentesis, very few LPs. And in the ICU, I think they do use it for central lines. I'm, you know, I don't practice there. I don't know if anybody else on the, on the Zoom has any comments about focus in the UH MICU? Too bad Dr. Hajal is not on. If she's not on, I'm sure she would. Yeah. Hey, Frank. Hey, Keith. Yeah, I mean, ultrasound is used routinely in the ICUs at both the uh, at both UH and VA. Uh, certainly for vascular access, it's been that for a long time. But it is, um, you know, all the the pulmonary critical care fellows get trained in it. You know, as part of their their summer boot camp. Um, and we are uh, actually in the process of having a few of our faculty members, uh, Shine Raju, uh, Amrita John, and um, Maroon Mata, who are getting formally certified uh, for for ultrasound. Who then uh, will be able to conduct, uh, you know, sort of formal certified training for the fellows and residents. But um, with the skill set of the fellows and residents, you know, routine, you know, most of the people on this call know this, but, you know, patients come in and part of the initial assessment uh, routinely involves a, a POCUS assessment awesome. at both institutions. Yeah, no, that's great. You're, you're training you're train the fellows. I visited an a, a international medical school a couple of years ago, uh, right for the pandemic, and um, they have first year gross anatomy and POCUS together. So first year medical school, I thought it was a cool career. I'm sure it's not unique to that program, a cool curricular, you know, the first year medical school teaching gross anatomy and focus side by side. And uh, Dr. Remy has his hand up. Yeah, just to, so first of all, just to springboard to what Frank said. So, you know, I, I've been using um, point of care ultrasound for about 14 years and been teaching for Society of Critical Care Medicine for about 10 um, with uh, formal instruction for for ultrasound. So Kevin, I think it's it's a fantastic, uh, absolute tool and, and, and integrated quite well, I think, in, in MICU practice. I think one of the difficulties associated with point of care ultrasound is, you know, Frank had intimated about initial assessments. Undeniably, it's really helpful. I think the challenge comes into play is when people are extrapolating initial assessment benefit of point of care ultrasound 
into patients that are chronically hospitalized and let's say came in with sepsis or septic shock and you know five days later their blood pressure due to a probably a multifactorial um, um, number of things uh, are, are leading towards them to have low blood pressure someone puts an ultrasound probe up against their uh, IVC and sees uh, easy uh, collapsibility and they immediately flood them with fluid that's not been borne out of the level of evidence and so I think finding where there's a benefit for using point of care of ultrasound and cr frankly where there are opportunities us for us to study in a research realm probably are really important because there's an inherent harm responding to findings on point of care ultrasound that may not necessarily have been borne out at least in the current level of evidence yeah i don't know what your thoughts are well i just say what well, kevin's been very helpful and and certainly helping us with some situations where residents might have overstepped their 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 capabilities and 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 in very evidence-based uh, guidelines to help, help in giving informative feedback go ahead kevin well you know i think uh dr remy i think it's a fantastic point um and i think i think what it comes down to is that um you know a lot of the uh, a lot of the information that would be incredibly helpful for us so for example what is the likelihood ratio um you know of a dilated plethoric ivc you know you know looking for a certain clinical etiology, the information is really not out there yet. And so I, I think that like what you said, I think it's incredibly important to, in fact, I think one of the most important things that I spend the most time teaching um, is to help people understand when their point of care ultrasound images are actually just not going to change their management. Um, and so whether that be just because the imaging quality is quite not high enough or because like with the example that you gave, somebody is using just partial information that's not really born well in the literature um, to make decisions that are really shouldn't be being uh, based off of that information. And so, um, you know, talking about, you know, using IVCs at the extreme, you know, never interpreting an inferior vena cava ex exam outside of also doing a focused limited cardiac assessment, always ensuring to, you know, do a um, a lung exam as well. So I, I think that I think that the most important thing to teach with point of care ultrasound outside of the fundamentals is what are the caveats? What are the risks? How do we ensure that we're not hurting somebody and that we really are providing um, you know providing really good quality care? Um, now my hope is that as the point of care ultrasound skills um, as a you know community of providers increases that it will become more and more possible to do studies to really, to really figure out what are the exams that we're doing that really are benefiting patients and which ones are benefiting them the most, most and you know, what's kind of our highest yield, um, highest yield studies and which studies are we doing that are not particularly helpful um, that really shouldn't be involved in, in management. And so I think until we have a critical mass of providers that could consistently do that and that can consistently clinically uh, correlate. I don't think we'll really get that information, but I do think that that periodic reassessment of what value are we adding by doing this, you know, additional thing for patients, I think is critically important. Yeah, I think that's brilliant. I think there's uh, definitely opportunities also for us to be a leader in the field and doing some of that research, definitely in both the floors and in the ICU. So great talk. Thank you. All right. We made a connection. <laughs> um, any other comments or questions? Um, I, I'm guessing Dr. Lopresti wasn't able to get on because you know he's the godfather of, of, of focus. Uh, no, I'm here, Keith. I thought that hey, was there great. You go, Charlie. Great. I'm not didn't mean to call you out. Hey, Charlie. No, just again, thank you for being the the pioneer and the the godfather. You made happy to support. Kevin an offer he couldn't refuse, apparently. Yeah, I yeah. certainly appreciate it. Awesome. Uh, one more question for uh, this is, I guess, from Vazu again for Frank or Ken, the ICU setting. Are we getting a follow up definitive radiology after initial POCUS? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it depends upon the finding, uh, you know, the POCUS finding. So, you know, often, um, you know, obviously, if it's vascular access, you know, uh, we're still getting uh, imaging to to assess, um, you know, placement of a central line, for example. Um, you know, if it's something acute like pneumothorax, um, you know, we may or may not act quickly if it's attention um, versus getting follow up imaging. 
I think, you know, it's it's frequently, as was as Kevin described, frequently used in this initial assessment of the uh, human anatomy of the unstable patient, cause of shock. Um, and, you know, often there's not a sort of a radiographic necessarily uh, correlate because it's a it's a multi, not multidisciplinary, but multifaceted assessment that's happening all together. And I think that's the point maybe that I wanted to make that I think everyone just remembers that ultrasound is just is an additional tool in sort of the comprehensive assessment of, of any physician. And I think for a long time, as ultrasound was trying to make its way onto the stage, there had to be this sort of push to say, hey, everyone needs to realize that ultrasound can do these things. And I think with time, many or most recognize the potential value of ultrasound. And I think, you know, uh, you know, beginning to sort of target, uh, you know, steer it back into the framework of basically an additional tool for the comprehensive uh, evaluation of the patient is I think an important message. Not that that's not what you said, but just trying to sort of, um, sort of reinforce that take home point. I think also to sit Dr. Sidigam's um, uh, question, and I don't want to mean to read too into it, but there certainly is a great opportunity uh, into evaluation of if we save images on patients to be able to then have different, so let's say trainees, residents across different uh, levels, uh, evaluate those images to see what they see and, and, and recognize, I guess, you know, specific landmarks and, and what they're finding. I, I suspect that there's a, a level of kappa variation, which actually could be a, a really nice educational tool, but probably a great opportunity for, for a, a research project. And furthermore, it could be evaluated against formal ultrasound done by radiology, just the same way that ECGs could be evaluated for kappa variability between trainees against, say, cardiologists. Could be a cool, nice project, actually. You know, that, that sounds like a, like a very interesting uh, project. And I, I think that what it really comes down to for, you know, for being able to do these projects, you need the architecture, you need the structure. Um, and that's one of the, the biggest things that, you know, I'm, I'm really just so incredibly grateful um, that, you know, Dr. Lopresti had the insight multiple years ago to get things in the works to, uh, you know, to start this synchronicity server system. Um, and, Multiple years later, pushing and pushing and pushing, we have finally been able to, um, you know, as Becca was saying, we're the second VA in the country that has successfully integrated this, um, you know, this uh, medical center wide server system. And it really overnight changed our ability and capability to provide meaningful uh, feedback to learners. And so the initial learners that have been, uh, you know, focused on or targeted with the synchronicity. Um, POCUS server have really been the attending physicians, with them being the, the gate holders and the people that are making sure that the point of care ultrasound findings are being clinically integrated. But we now have um, every single point of care ultrasound uh, study that's being done at the Cleveland VA Medical Center um, on our CARP based systems is stored along with the findings and interpretations um, by that provider. Um, those findings are then overread by myself um, so that that person gets feedback about was I correct? Was I incorrect? Um, you know, was I close? What could I have done to make my imaging, you know, acquisition more effective? Um, or, you know, the, the biggest thing is, did somebody overcall something? Did somebody get an image quality that wasn't really quite high enough to make the call that they did? And so those are the kinds of things that we are, we're focusing on. And of course, we're now developing a massive library of quality assured um, point of care ultrasound images that we have that we have access to. And we're doing this all under the um, with the safety or the backdrop of making sure that anybody who's doing point of care ultrasound at the VA Medical Center who has not um, you know, achieved competence and does not have clinical privileges for point of care ultrasound, they're doing all of their point of care ultrasound images with a gold standard test that is pending. So whether that's somebody that's doing a DVT study and there's a formal DVT ultrasound that's pending or whether somebody's looking for pneumonia and they have a, you know, a CT that's pending um, or somebody who's doing you know, focused cardiac, um, you know, like a limited uh, cardiac uh, ultrasound scan, um, you know, there's gonna be a formal echo pending. And so that means that we are constantly comparing um, you know, the point of care ultrasound exams that are done at an attending level to both my overreads and also a gold standard as well, um, 
to give that information. And we've just seen explosive growth in the skills as we've implemented that system. So, so big thank you to Charlie who really put that into motion. Um, and our, we had a, a huge biomedical team that helped us kind of take that over the finish line this January. So really exciting. So I think the synchronicity at the VA would, is huge, obviously. Um, I will say that UH does have the capability to do something similar. I mean, the ED department just puts their images into packs. Um, and so you don't necessarily need to have a third party software solution. Um, if, if we wanted to expand, Kevin, if you were looking to figure out how to do that within UH at CMC, mm -hmm. that probably does exist. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think UH, we have pockets of high levels of proficiency and education in the ER and the ER residency. And it sounds like in the pulmonary critical care fellows and burgeoning in the pulmonary critical care attendings, um, but it's not as, you know, not nearly as developed as it is on, on the other side of the university circle. So um, with one last, one last quick question, will, will the POCUS replace its stethoscope? Oh, okay. Well, I'd, I'd be happy to answer that. Um, so I would say no. I'd say if you can bring me an ultrasound device that can I can hear wheezing on, then maybe we can start talking. But I, I really do think that it's incredibly important for people to understand that gaining skills in point of care ultrasound is not an excuse to not do a good physical examination. Um, and I think that you know the thing that comes to mind for me the most is when you have a what we would call an acute lung or a, a dry lung process where you have an acutely dyspneic patient that's showing up with a cause of dyspnea that is um, not related to interstitial edema, you know, you're gonna need a stethoscope to be able to identify, is this somebody who's dyspneic from bronchospasm? Is this somebody who doesn't have interstitial edema or bronchospasm and they're dyspneic because they have a pulmonary embolism? So I, I think if anything, my comfort with the physical exam, including the stethoscope has only um, in, improved. Uh, and I've only, I've only been even more in tune with my physical exam um, since I started doing point of care ultrasound. And I've heard very similar things from my colleagues. I would be curious as to what the, you know, the pulmonology team uh, feels about that. Uh, I would, I would agree with that. You know, um, to use an analogy, I always thought having GPS devices in cars would improve everyone's knowledge of maps and roads because you have all this other information about what's around you while you're driving. Unfortunately, a lot of people tune out and they, and they just listen to their GPS, but I think ultrasound has the same thing. You do an exam and then you have this additional information. And like you said, it should actually make you even more, have a deeper sense of what's going on with your patient related to your physical exam rather than less. So I really like your comments. Thanks. And Charlie, did you have any thoughts on that? Like physical examination and its role with point of care ultrasound, anything you wanted to share? I, so I actually do think it's going to replace the stethoscope eventually. We're not there yet. Um, as trainees through medical school and GME become proficient with it, I do think that we probably see the stethoscope get phased out. Now, that's not to say that we're minimizing the physical exam. There's still other aspects to it. Um, and I really do see POCUS as an extension of the physical exam. Thank you. Awesome. Um, we're bumping up against one o'clock and uh, some more some more commentary, but no questions. Uh, amusing commentary. So again, I want to thank Kevin for really fantastic grand rounds and and so grateful for all your leadership and education around POCUS. Um, so uh, uh, Ken, Ken, I think we're out of time. If you have if you have one last comment, I see your hands up. No, I was I was clapping my hands. Oh, clapping. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Thank Kevin. You. That was awesome. Thank you. Appreciate it. No misinterpretation. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.